Section 2.5, generalization, regularization, and validation. Data available while learning and calibrating a model is called the seen data, and future data is called unseen data. These concepts were introduced in section 2.1. Our purpose of fitting a model based on seen data is that it will ultimately work well for unseen data, a property known as generalization ability. With this view, when seeking models that generalize well, there are two competing negative attributes that one needs to balance, underfitting and overfitting. The former is a case where the trained model fails to use key features of the seen data that, if used, would have yielded better performance. The latter is a case where the model is so specialized to the training data such that unseen examples that slightly differ from the training data do not perform well. The theme of model selection in machine learning and statistics deals with the calibration of underfitting and overfitting to yield models that generalize well. Model selection, or the quest for optimal generalization ability, is one of the hardest problems in machine learning, primarily because the unseen data is not available. For this, one needs to judiciously budget the seen data by splitting it into the training set the testing set, and also carry out validation in one of several ways that we outline in this section. In quantifying generalization ability, there are several plots and measures that one can use. These include the quantification of model bias, model variance, and the bias variance trade-off. We present these in this section. Some classes of models are by construction designed to enable calibration of underfitting, overfitting, or the bias variance trade-off. One general technique for this is called regularization, which is the, in one common form, includes the introduction of additional terms to the model objective or the loss function. We present a taste of regularization techniques here, and then in section 5.7, we focus on regularization in the context of deep neural networks. In terms of notation, throughout this book, we use D, this big D, to denote data with N samples. This sometimes means only the training set, and in other cases means all of the seen data. When we focus on training specific types of models, such as in section 2.3, the symbol D is treated as the data allocated specifically for training, and hence we assume there are N training samples for training and potentially other samples for testing and or validation that we do not account for. In other cases, D is treated as all of the available seen data part of which may be used for testing via testing or holdout set, a testing or holdout set, which we denote via D subtest with N test samples. Performance on unseen data. We've already introduced several ex examples of performance metrics in section 2.2. These include accuracy. Accuracy was in equation 2.6 the F1 score, that was in equation 2.7, mean square error in the case of regression, and others. In some cases, one wishes to maximize the performance metric, whereas in other cases, one wishes to minimize it. Note that the loss function used in model training is in some instances directly related or equal to the performance metric, and in other instances, it is different. It is notationally convenient to relate a performance function to the performance metric. We denote the performance function via P, and it penalizes differences between a single predicted label Y hat and the actual label Y. For example, when the mean square error performance metric is used, then the performance function is P 
of y hat and y is the difference of y hat and y squared. As another example, if the accuracy performance metrics is used in classification, then the performance function, which takes now big Y hat, which is the actual label, and Y is an indicator of Y hat not equaling Y, where one is an indicator function and Y is taken as an actual label. Note that we construct the performance function such that small values are desirable. Here's a footnote. In this section, to avoid notational confusion between y hat small and y hat big, we use a notation y hat small for both cases. When we train a model and create a predictor, either for regression or classification, we use the data D and based on the model, obtain a predictor denoted by Y hat of something given D. Now for some data pair X, Y, the value Y hat at X, given all of the data D, is a prediction of Y and the performance function evaluation for the prediction of this data is the pair, uh, this data pair is the performance function applied to the predictor for that point X and the actual label Y. As outlined in section 2.1, we ensure that the nature of the data is similar to that of unseen data. And with this, the underlying mathematical assumption is that both seen and unseen data are generated by the same underlying processes. Hence, for both theoretical and empirical analysis, unless we know otherwise, we assume that the probability distribution of each data sample, xi, yi, is the same for all i1 through n, and is further the same as the distribution of each unseen data sample, which we can denote via x star comma y star. That is, we assume there is an underlying probability space for the observations, and we vaguely denote the joint probabilities of the feature and labels via P of X, Y. Our usage of probabilistic statements here is only via expected values, where we denote the expectation operator via this E, and often use a subscript for the expectation to denote the objects that are treated as random. That will become clear shortly. With this notation, the expected value of performance of the trained model for unseen data points x star y star is denoted via E unseen, which is the expectation where x star and y star are the random components of the performance function applied on the predictor x star, the predictor y hat for data point x star, compared to y star. Notice that the data train is fixed in E unseen, where D train is a training data. This quantity is called the generalization performance or generalization error. It may be viewed as an average over all possible unseen data points, that's the X star, Y star, and hence E unseen, E subscript unseen, evaluates how well the predictor or model generalizes. With the given training data set, D trained, our aim is to build a model that yields the smallest possible E unseen. Unfortunately, it is based on unseen data. Since it's based on unseen data, E unseen is a theoretical construct. And since we do not know, we do not know the probability law, P, X, Y exactly, we cannot compute E unseen. However, as a first attempt, we can approximate the expectation by averaging over available training data. That is, E train would be the arithmetic mean, one divided by the number of training samples, one untrained, summing all over all of the XY pairs in E train, 
and in each case putting x and y here. Okay, so that is E train. So, so far we've seen E unseen and E train. Where N train is the number of observations in D train. It turns out that E train is typically a poor estimator of E unseen because the same training observations that were used to create the predictor are also used to evaluate the predictor performance. That is, the learned parameters of the model, theta hat, that are used to construct y hat depend on D train. Hence, while E-Train does present us with some insight about the ability of our model to produce, to reproduce the data that has been learned, it lacks the ability to estimate performance on unseen data. In order to get a better estimate of E unseen, it is preferable to average over data that has not been used for training the model, namely over the test set. In an ideal situation, where we use the test set only once and do not calibrate and adjust the model based on the test set, the test set observations are completely independent of the model. In such a case, the estimator E subtest, which is the arithmetic mean over the test data that has N test observations, where that now we take X and Y coming from the test set Still, with the predictor y hat, which is based on the training set, which has theta hat. So E test is a good estimator of E unseen, especially for significantly large N test. So when we have a lot of observations in the test set. Specifically under the assumption that the unseen data and the test set have the same distribution, the expected value of E test is exactly E unseen, making it a statistically unbiased estimator of performance. Further, it is statistically consistent in the sense that if we're able to allocate more testing data and N test grows to infinity or increases, then E test converges to E unseen. This is simply a consequence of the law of large numbers. Note that these desirable statistical properties are only for fixed D train. So that's when the training data is still fixed. Just a footnote, formally the convergence E test to E unseen may be seen as convergence and probability in one form or almost sure convergence or convergence with probability one as we say in a different form. We do not fo focus on these subtleties here. The straightforward statistical properties of unbiasedness and consistency enjoyed by E-test make the practice of putting out a test set for performance evaluation or putting aside, we should say, test for performance evaluation attractive. <laughs> However, setting aside a test set is costly as we effectively throw away end test observations and do not use them for improving the model. For this reason, it is often tempting in practice to iteratively evaluate 226 while adjusting model setting and hyperparameters. So to iteratively adjust e-test while adjusting and setting model parameters. This frowned upon practice breaks the independence between the test and the model, at which point the desirable statistical properties of e-test are lost. Hence, as an alternative, we use a validation set or some other method as described below. So we'll describe that shortly. In addition to using an independent test set as an equation 226, other alternatives for estimation of performance also exist, which include using case fault cross-validation. This is a topic we describe below in the context of validation and hyperparameter optimization, yet it may also be used for purposes of performance evaluation at its on its own. Full choice, underfitting, and overfitting. The generalization performance in 224 is specific to a fixed single training data set, D train. However, for a given problem, when considering which type of model to use and what hyperparameters to choose, it is often useful to think about the expectation over all possible training 
data sets. For this, we define the expected generalization performance. So E tilde unseen, the expected generalization performance, is the expected expectation with respect to the training data set of E unseen. And that can be written as the expectation of the expectation, where the inner expectation is the expectation with respect to a single unseen observation. And the outer expectation is expectation with respect to the actual training data set. It represents the average of E unseen over all possible data sets D train of a given size from the from uh, the same probability law, PXY, where we keep in mind that each data set potentially yields a different representation of the model. A similar quantity for the training set is E tilde train, and that's the expectation with respect to D train of E train, and you can take the one on N train out because it's just a constant value, not a random variable with respect to the expectation. And that's the expectation of D train of this thing. Keep in mind that E tilde unseen and E tilde train are functions of the type of model used, the hyperparameters and the training data set size. With such relationships present, the machine learning engineer can in principle ponder about the theoretical shape of E tilde unseen and E tilde train and seek a model that appears best. In this respect, the generalization gap defined as delta tilde, the difference between E tilde unseen and E tilde train is also important. The combination of E tilde unseen and E tilde train and the generalization gap based on estimates allow one to seek a balance between underfitting and overfitting. There are multiple suggestions on best practice for using the available data to estimate E tilde unseen, E tilde train, and the generalization gap, and to select the best model. A thorough discussion of such best practices is beyond our scope. The notes and references at the end of the chapter link to further reading. Instead, let us consider the schematic figure 2.9, which presents typical behavior of E tilde unseen and E tilde train as a function of model complexity. So here is a figure. Generally, as model complexity increases, expected training performance E train improves, that's decreases, since complex structure models can explain the training data better. At high extremes, this is overfitting. Similarly, an opposite phenomena is that models with low complexity are not able to describe the data well. The trade-off between these two regimes is obtained at the minimum E tilde unseen, marked by the vertical lash, dashed line. In practice, unless present, presented with an infinite pool of data, one is not able to evaluate E tilde unseen and E tilde train directly, and one is certainly not able to evaluate these quantities over all possibilities of models, hyperparameters, and sample sizes. Nevertheless, much of the practice of model selection involves around getting a feel for the dependence of E tilde unseen and E tilde train on model choice hyperparameters and sample size. This is typically done using very limited measurements from one or several training and validation executions. Typical practice is to monitor empirical estimates of these quantities as a function of model complexity, hyperparameter choice, or sample size. The most basic practice is evaluation of E train of 225, together with a validation performance measure that is similar in nature to E test of 226, such as a validation performance or cake cross fold, cake fold cross validation performance, which are defined in the sequel. So see some equations 237 and 238 below. As one simple illustrative example capturing the trade-offs of model complexity, let us consider linear models with polynomial features applied to synthetic univariate, that's p equals one data. The model y equals beta zero plus beta one x squared plus beta 
plus beta 1x plus beta 2x squared plus beta k to x to the power k plus some error is denoted by nk, where k is the order of the polynomial. Hence, m0 is a constant model, m1 is the simple linear model, m2 is a quadratic model, and so on. A quadratic model of this nature was used in equation 2.4 of section 2.2. That was in the housing pricing data. In this framework, model complexity corresponds to the degree of the polynomial model. Now taking one possible realization of D-train in figure 210, we use a family of models to fit data of size n-train equals 10. With this single realization, we clearly see underfitting behaviors for models M0 and M1. In contrast, model M9 appears to overfit the observed data. In fact, it's a, it's a perfect interpolation, a polynomial interpolation. Between these two extremes, model M3 looks like an appropriate representation of the observed data. So that's just visually looking at A. In figure 210b, the red curve presents E train for this data set. That's not E tilde train, that's not expected generalization performance, that's just generalization performance. It is obvious that as K increases, training fit improves. Further, further in this hypothetical example, since we know the underlying process with probability law, PXY, used for purposes of simulation of synthetic data, we may sample as many X star, Y star pairs as we wish to obtain rel a reliable estimate of E unseen. This curve is plotted in black, where in this case, we use 10,000 repetitions for each K. Each time with, fixed mo with the fixed model based on our single available data set, D train. This Monte Carlo simulation makes it clear that when k equals 9 or k equals 8, there's overfitting, and when k equals 0, 1, 2, there is underfitting. In practice, plots exactly like figure 210b cannot be produced because we do not know pxy. Instead, one can resort to estimates based on cross-validation to obtain curves similar to the black curve in figure 210b. We also mentioned that while we stated that key elements that affect expected uh, performance and performance are the model type, hyperparameters, and sample size, in the world of deep learning, there is also an additional major factor, training time. For deep learning models, since the number of parameters in the model is often huge, letting the model train for longer is similar to using a more complex model as presented in figure 2.9. More on this is in chapter 4, where we discuss some best practices for training deep learning models. Bias and variance decomposition. A related view to the analysis of expected generalization performance and generalization gap is a so-called bias and variance decomposition. It focuses on the expected generalization performance in production, E tilde unseen, and decomposes it into a sum of terms related to model bias, model variance, and the noise magnitude. With this decomposition, underfitting is said to be a situation with high model bias, and overfitting is said to be a situation with high model variance. Using this terminology, balancing model bias and model variance is equivalent to balancing underfitting and overfitting respectively. This is known as the bias and variance trade-off. The bias and variance decomposition is mathematically elegant in the special case of square error performance function. That's P of y hat and y, which is the square difference between y hat and y, and a specifically assumed underlying random reality which is y is a deterministic function f of x plus epsilon with the expectation of epsilon being zero and independent of x. Here, x is a vector of features and y is a scalar real-valued label. 
further assume that the second moment of epsilon is the variance of the noise term and is called further, sorry, the second moment of epsilon is the variance of the noise term and is called inherent noise. In this setting, for some unseen feature vector x star, the predictor trained on data d is y hat x star of d, which we also denote via f hat of x star of d, since it estimates f x star. Hence, the expected generalization performance of 227 becomes an expectation with respect to d, with respect to x star, and with respect to epsilon, and you could write it as follows, right? Where this was your actual y, and this was your y hat here. Okay. Now, a standard algebraic manipulation common in statistics is to add and subtract the expectation with respect to the randomness of D and X star in this case, of F hat X star D inside 231. Expand the expression, apply the external expectation operator, and then cancel out terms that have zero expectation, resulting from the fact that the expectation of the noise is zero, and the fact that the noise epsilon and X star are assumed independent. This manipulation transforms 231 to the bias variance noise decomposition equation. That's equation 232. So what we see in 232 is the E tilde unseen, the expected generalization performance, is the bias squared, it's the variance, and it's the inherent noise or the sum of all of these three terms. So that's this decomposition. This decomposition, we keep in mind, was it works nicely when uh, we assume this loss and this type of noise structure in the model. Otherwise, it doesn't work well, but it has uh, become popular. Here, the first term is the square of the bias. The second term is the variance taking into consideration variability both from D star used for training and X star. And the third term is inherent noise. The expectations and variances in the bias and variance terms are with respect to the, are with respect to the training data set D and the arbitrary unseen feature vector X star. The main takeaway from 2.32 is that if we ignore the inherent noise, so if we momentarily just ignore the inherent noise, the loss of the model has two components, model bias. Technically, it's the model bias squared, but that's the model bias. It's called the bias. And the model variance. The model bias is a measure of how a typical expectation over all sample data points, all possible data samples, model f hat d, misspecifies the correct relationship f. <coughs> model classes with high bias <coughs> have that f hat of d does not accurately predict f. That is, high bias generally implies underfitting. Similarly, model classes with low model bias are detailed descriptions of reality since the expected difference in the bias term is near zero. So if this is zero, then we get a good description of reality. The model variance is a measure of the variability of the model class, f hat d, with respect to the random sample d and the distribution of x star is implicitly implied by the probability law of the data pxy. Model classes with high model variance are often overfit. Okay. Model classes um, to the training data and do not generalize to unseen data well. Similarly, similarly, model classes with low model variance are much more robust to the training data and generalize to the unseen data much better. Similar analysis to the, the derivation that leads to 232, to this uh, popular bias-various-noise decomposition, that's 232, 
Okay. So a similar analysis to the derivation that leads to 232 can also be attempted for other performance functions other than squared error and model structures other than 230. With such other settings, the mathematical elegance of 232 is often lost. Nevertheless, the concepts of model bias, model variance, and the bias variance trade-off still persist. For example, in a classification setting, you may compare the accuracy obtained on the training set to that obtained on the validation set. If there is high discrepancy where the training accuracy is much higher than the validation accuracy, then there's probably a variance problem indicating that the model is overfitting. Okay, addition of regularization terms. One natural way to control model variance is to induce or force model parameters to remain within some confined subset of the parameter space. This is called regularization. At the extreme case where all model parameters are zero, the model variance vanishes as well. In less extreme cases where there is only some constraint on model parameters, model variance is still controlled. Such decreases in model variance may imply an increase of model bias. Nevertheless, the ultimate goal of optimizing the expected performance loss typically merits such adjustments. So the key here is that we can pay with a bit of model variance, a middle bit of model bias, and significantly decrease model variance, and that's sometimes called regularization. A common way to keep model parameters at bay is to augment the optimization objective min of theta of C theta given D with an additional regularization term, say R sub lambda of theta. The revised objective is then as follows. The re regularization term R sub lambda of theta depends on a regularization parameter lambda, which is often a scalar in the range zero infinity, but also sometimes a vector. This hyperparameter allows us to optimize the bias invariance trade-off. A common general regularization technique called elastic net has regularization parameter lambda, which is lambda actually a vector of length two, lambda one and lambda two. And the regularization term is lambda one times the L1 norm of theta plus lambda two times the L2 norm squared of theta with here's the L1 norm here is the L2 norm squared of theta, where D is a dimension of the parameter space. Hence, the values of lambda 1 and lambda 2 determine what kind of penalty the objective function will pay for high values of theta i. Footnote. Note that in cases such as linear regression or deep neural networks, where there is a constant term beta 0, for example, the parameters for the constant term are typically not regularized, and hence the norms are taken only on the other parameters. Okay, so in practice, the summation here might be only on the, um, not on the first term. And that's the detail. Clearly with lambda one and lambda two both zeros, the original objective is unmodified. In contrast, as lambda one goes to infinity or lambda two goes to infinity, the estimates theta i go to zero because then uh, the best way to uh, minimize theta here is just to drive those estimates to zero, okay? Because that's in here. And any information in the data is fully ignored. Indeed, as lambda one or lambda two grow, the model bias grows while model variance has decreased and overfitting is mitigated. With regularization, there is often a magical sweet spot for lambda where the objective 233 does a good job at fitting the model. Of course, it's often sometimes hard to find that sweet spot. Particular cases, 
of elastic net, this type of regularization, are the classic ridge regression, also called Tikhonov regularization, and LASSO standing for the least absolute uh, shrinkage and selection operator. In the former, so in ridge regression, lambda one is zero, so you only have the L2 cost, and only lambda two is used. And in the latter, lambda two is zero, and only lambda one is used. You only have the L1 cost. One of the benefits of lasso is present, also present in the more general elastic net case, is that the theta one cost allows the algorithm to remove variables from the model by completely zeroing them out, by zeroing out the theta i values completely. Hence, lasso is a very useful modern sele model selection technique. Now we focus a bit on ridge regression. The case of ridge regression or Tikhonov regularization is slightly simpler to analyze in lasso, and it fits well within the framework of linear models presented in section 2.3. We thus present the details now. For ridge regression, the data fitting problem can be represented as the minimum over theta in Rd of the mean square error or y minus x theta norm squared, and that's an L2 norm, plus the regularization cost. And again, remember that sometimes maybe if theta has a bias term, you don't have the bias term here. But again, that's a detail. Where the design matrix X is in, as in equation 210, where we had the design matrix that has all the data. And we now consider lambda as a scalar. Previously in uh, equation 234 above, it was denoted as lambda two. And it's a scalar in the range zero infinity. Okay. So lambda is a scalar in the range zero infinity. Compare 235 with the original least squares objective 213. So you can compare these two objectives and you see that we just added this additional object, the, the additional term. Now by manipulating the norm squared expressions, the problem can be recast as minimum of theta and Rd, where we now actually have this vector y, and y uh, with more zeros on it, minus x tilde lambda theta, where x tilde lambda is like that. Okay, let's read the footnote. In practice, we often do not regularize the intercept term, and this requires adjusting the identity matrix uh, here. Okay, but again, same on, on all that detail of the intercept term. The pseudo inverse associated with x tilde lambda is x tilde lambda dagger, and we can represent it as follows. Hence, returning to 216, the parameter estimate for ridge regression is as follows. Okay. As an aside, note that for any lambda strictly positive, this matrix, which is the gram matrix plus lambda times the identity matrix, this identity matrix is d-dimensional, but again, d minus one if you ignore the intercept term, okay, is not singular even if x transpose x is singular. Also, as lambda goes to zero, it can be shown that this pseudo inverse, which you have here, actually converges to the pseudo inverse, the moore ponroe pseudo inverse, which we would get by SVD. Okay. We know that while, the while for linear models, the results are very elegant, in other cases, Closed form solutions such as 236, so this is 236, do not exist. Still, many machine learning cost functions can be augmented with a regularization term. We revisit these concepts in section 5.7, that's chapter 5, we'll be there in a while, in the context of deep learning, where other regularization methods are presented as well. Also note that the regularization parameter lambda is a first class example of a hyperparameter that one would like to calibrate during learning. This specific parameter serves as a good lever for optimizing the bias and variance trade-off. We discuss the general topic of hyperparameter optimization now.
hyperparameter calibration and cross validation. As alluded to above, calibrating the model choice and the hyperparameters while reusing the testing set for performance evaluation is bad practice since it pollutes the testing set performance estimator e-test of 226. For this reason, it is common to further split the training data, D-train, using one of several ways while experimenting with model configurations and hyperparameters. With such an approach, D-test is reserved only for final performance evaluation before rolling out the model to production. Such use of the training data, where some parts of the data are used for training parameters, and the other parts are used for checking performance and tuning hyperparameters is generally called cross-validation. There are multiple common cross-validation techniques with many variants used in practice. Here we present only two main approaches, the train-validate split approach and k-fold cross-validation. The train-validate split approach is common in situations where the total number of data points n is large. The k-fold cross-validation approach is useful when data is limited. The train-validate split approach simply implies that the original data with n samples is first split to training and testing as before, and then the training data is further split into two subsets where the first is confusingly again called the training set, and the latter is the validation set. Hence, considering all the available data D, with this approach, the data D is a um, disjoint union of the training data, the validation data, and the testing data. When considering all of the data, this approach is also called the train validate test split approach. If, for example, we use an 80-20 rule, both splits and assuming this visibility holds, then N test is going to be 20% of the data. N train is going to be 16% of the 64% uh, of the data. And then the um, N validation is going to be 16% of the data. Okay, because, um, yeah, that's how you get it. As an example, assume the model is fixed, yet regularized with some elastic net as presented above. Hence, the hyperparameters in question are lambda equals lambda 1, lambda 2, and the choice of these needs to be tuned. The approach is then to evaluate the estimator on D train over a grid of such hyperparameters with retraining from scratch for every delta. We then choose lambda star as argmax uh, of the E validation lambda, where E validation lambda is just an average of the uh, validation set. So we never use a validation set for training the parameters theta hat. Okay, and for every lambda, this is theta hat of lambda, and then we find a grid of lambda and optimize. Where you can see that the predictor y hat depends on the hyperparameter. With the optimal lambda star pair selected, the model with this lambda star is then evaluated and tested once via 226, that was E test, before being rolled out to production. As one can imagine, this textbook approach may encounter multiple difficulties and thus has many variants in practice. More aspects dealing with hyperparameter optimization are in the sequel. In case of limited <coughs> observations, a train valid at test split may be too wasteful of data, and an alternative approach is k-fold cross-validation is illustrated in figure 211. So this is a figure of k-fold cross-validation. We'll get to it in a second. This approach may be used on all of the data D or only on the training data after a train test split is performed. Here, for simplicity, we apply it for some data set D. The approach is useful both for model selection, hyperparameter optimization, and performance evaluation as well. The value K of this approach, which determines the number of data chunk repetitions, is a static configuration parameter with typical value being K equals 5 or K equals 10. 
Okay, let's not confuse this K with K used for the number of classes in multi-class problems. The approach is to split D into K equally sized data chunks is denoted D superscript K. Okay, so that's the split which you have here. Then for each K, we fix a training set to be composed of all of the observations except for DK and the validation set may be also called a testing set to be DK. That is denoting set differences with a slash. We said when we are working on the case chunk, the D train is all of the data except for DK and the D validation is DK. Okay, equals one K. Okay, so this is, here you have your K chunks, okay? And each time it's like, this is a training, this is a validation. This is a training, this is a validation, et cetera, et cetera. Up to this is a training, this is a validation. We now retrain and evaluate the model separately for each data chunk K, where each time we use D train K as a training data and DK validation as a validation or testing data. That is, for example, if K, e, capital K equals 10, originally D has N observations, then for each K, we have N train is 0, 9 times N, and N validation is 0 0.1 times N. Again, let's assume that uh, N is properly divisible by 10. With the model change separately for each repetition K, we can now estimate performance via E, the CV stands for cross-validation, not for coefficient of variation, for cross-validation. And that's the mean over the K validation sets, with EK validation being exactly as follows, where Y hat K is a predictor trained for repetition K. Once again, if needed, hyperparameter optimization may take place by treating ECV as a function of the hyperparameter in question, for example, as a function of lambda. Also, as mentioned above, in situations where the total number of observations is low, and if not tweaking parameters, then k-fold cross-validation may serve as an alternative approach to general performance evaluation using a train test split. Again, as with the train validate test split approach, there are multiple variations for k-fold cross-validation with the exact method used in practice often depending on the specific situation encountered. So thank you, everybody. This concludes section 2.5. As always, let us know what you think in the comments below. Hope it was useful. Thank you.